Okay, so a um, couple of comments about this morning. So somebody asked uh, about uh, uh, the compactness, whether it was local in space. I think it was you, yes. Uh, yeah, I, I should have mentioned that there is still one easy way to work around this, which is just a, a canter diagonal argument uh, going further and further afield, okay? But uh, there are still, there's still a lot of stuff that I brushed under the rug, uh, some details are missing, and uh, I will not have time to, to work those out for you. Okay, so now uh, we have existence, well posedness for uh, Euler and Navier Stokes in dimension three, and we also have in dimension two. Uh, <coughs> and uh, now the for smooth solutions, local in time. And now the question that we pose is how can we lose uh, uh, this uh, smoothness? How can we get out of the, uh, the smooth realm? Okay, how can we lose uh, existence um, in, these, uh, in this smooth uh, setting? Okay, so <coughs> the question now is, so we have well posedness, local in time, how to lose. Paths, in other words, paths to blow up. So the, um, the problem of existence of a smooth solution to Euler slash never Stokes globally in time in three dimensions. In two dimensions, we'll see that it's actually uh, uh, well established, but in, in three dimensions, this is a wide open problem. It's one of the, the, the clay millennium problems in the case of never Stokes, okay? Um, it's still open, all right? And what we want to understand now is uh, what, how do we get there, okay? Now, I should add that there is a preprint on, uh, on archive uh, claiming to show claiming to conclude that you, you have singularity formation for Euler. In other words, you do have blow up for Euler uh, uh, in three dimensions and it's a computer assisted proof. The, the, the jury is still out, but it's looking good, okay? So despite that, I will, will say that so far we don't have a complete theory. All right, um, so recall that we have a, for, for our uh, solution, DTU plus U, U grad bu is minus gradient of pressure plus nu Laplacian nu, divergence of U equals zero, okay? And now we have a solution to this, so now I can do calculations directly on this equation without going for the approximations, okay? So I take d alpha of this and then I write dt of d alpha u plus d alpha of u grad u is minus gradient d alpha u plus mu Laplacian d alpha u. And I do the same thing, I multiply by d alpha u and then I integrate in uh, space and, uh, yeah, space. Okay. And what I get is ddt one half d alpha u l2 squared okay. plus the commutator because the term, <coughs> uh, so it's going to be plus the integral of d alpha of u grad u minus u grad d alpha u. Actually, minus, uh, I want d alpha grad u times d alpha u because this term here is identically zero. Okay, so when you, you take this integral here, this is identically zero. This is equal to, so the term with the gradient of pressure, where is it? Uh, okay. I forgot the gradient of pressure. Ah, must be here. Okay, 
Um, so <coughs> this term goes away again because the alpha u is also divergence free. All right, and then you wind up with minus nu times the gradient of d alpha u squared when you integrate by parts. Okay. Then we use our calculus inequalities for the commutator term, and you wind up with dot 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 ddt. And once you sum over all alpha less than m, you wind up with hm squared less than or equal to a constant. And instead of writing uhm to the cubed, I'm going to write gradient of u, l infinity, uhm squared. Before, we had m sufficiently large, and I was putting this guy here into hm using the Sobolev and Metier, or is it a quality if you want? Okay. But now I want to keep this gradient of u l infinity. Okay, because now I can see that, of course, you can cancel one of these. You can see that h m is bounded by whatever it was initially times the exponential of the integral in time of the gradient of u l infinity. Okay, we end up with this. All right, so that's what's controlling. So the gradient of u and l infinity is controlling uh, the blow up. While this is finite, you're fine, hm norm is finite, you don't have any blow up, you can extend your solution a little further. Okay? Okay. Um, so what I want to talk about now is a theorem due to Beal, Cato, and Maida. And I believe that this is 1984 or maybe 85. In any case, it's last century, as have I. Okay. Let you be a strong solution. I'm going to do this for Euler, but the proof is exactly the same with Navier-Stokes, because you just throw away the, the uh, new Laplacian term. Okay. Then, and by strong solution here, I mean the solution that we constructed. Okay, the wells posed in this. Then, the limb soup this T goes to capital T from the left of the HM norm of T. This remains finite if and only if, if and only if, the integral from zero to T of omega of S L infinity dS is finite, where omega is the vorticity. Okay. So the Bilkatomida theorem, okay, uh, what it's doing is it's trading off the full gradient of velocity in L infinity by the L infinity norm of the vorticity. Why do we care? Okay. Because vorticity has an independent, or not independent, has a full evolution equation. Okay. And in particular, this enables us to show very easily that in two dimensions, if you start out smooth, you remain smooth globally in time. You do not blow up. Okay? That's why we care. That's one reason. There's another reason, which is computational, which is that since you, can ha you have an evolution equation, which is actually a sort of a nice transport equation type of equation for the vorticity in the, in the Euler case, it, this becomes a very easy to implement uh, numerical uh, criteria, numerical uh, test. Okay, so you can test whether uh, numerically whether you're blowing up or not in theory. Okay. Okay. So this means this is if and only if blow up, uh, no blow up, in fact. So. Uh, stated otherwise, in order for you to have blow up, you need to have the the uh, vorticity getting out of time into L infinity in space. Okay? Proof. 
Okay. So we need a careful potential theory estimate. Note that the gradient of UNL infinity and the vorticity are of the same order of derivative. Okay? They're related actually by a zero or zeroth order uh, differential operator, all right? uh, which is a combination of Riesz transforms, for those of you who know what that is. Okay? Now the problem is <coughs> these objects behave badly in L infinity. If this were P instead of being infinity, okay, you'd be done, you'd be fine. The problem is that it's infinity. So you cannot estimate the gradient of UNL infinity by the L infinity norm of the vortices. You can if it were P less than infinity greater than 1. But at, at, at infinity, you can't. So <coughs> instead, you prove the following estimate. The gradient of U, L infinity, is bounded by a constant 1 plus log plus u h 3 3 is enough okay times omega l infinity plus omega l2 if this were p i stress if this were p you would have constant and you would have p here and p here and you wouldn't need this guy okay so this is a correction that's needed because you have p equals infinity Right. Okay, and the proof of this estimate here is rather straightforward. You just write uh, everything in terms of these uh, Newtonian potentials and then uh, estimate away. Okay, there's, there's no, no big trick. Okay. For those of you who want a uh, reference, you can look at the uh, bertozzi Maida book. And the proof is correct. Okay. okay, so what do we need here in order to transform? So, so uh, okay, first of all, what, which direction are we going to show? We're going to show that if this is bounded, then this is finite. So you have no blow up because the opposite direction is very easy. Okay. Okay. So what I need is, I already know that the L HM norm is bounded by the L infinity norm of vorticity, okay, of, of uh, the gradient of, of velocity. <coughs> uh, therefore, what I need, this guy I want to retain, okay? This is going to be something bounded, okay? Uh, and so I need to estimate this also by this, okay? That's what I need to do. So which direction are we doing? Is this one. I need to show that the L2 norm is bounded by some function of the L1 norm in time of the L infinity norm of vorticity. Okay. And for this, uh, to do this, we use the vorticity equation. Well, I said I was going to do this for, and here I am sticking uh, a uh, viscosity here. Okay, doesn't matter; it's going to go away. Okay, so uh, here's my vorticity equation, which I will multiply by omega and integrate in R3, and I get DDT of the L2 norm of the vorticity squared. This term goes away because this is omega dotted with u dot grad omega, and then you can put the u dot grad onto omega, and then this becomes u dot grad of norm of u omega squared over 2. u is divergence free. That term goes away. Okay, So this is equal to the integral of omega dotted with omega dot grad u plus or minus nu times 
gradient of omega squared. Like I said, this guy here goes away. Okay? Okay, so this is less than or equal to. Um, I think this is just straightforward. Yeah. So I'm just going to put this guy here in L1 and this in L infinity and there. Okay, so I have DDT of omega L2 squared bounded by a constant uh, gradient of, of UL infinity times omega L2 squared. This automatically gives me that omega L2 squared is bounded by whatever it was initially times the exponential of the integral. Oh, sorry, I did something wrong. almost this. What I want to do here is I, I don't want to put this guy in L infinity. I want to put this guy here in L2. I want to put one of these in L infinity and the other one in L2. So this is going to be bounded by L infinity and then I have omega L2 uh, times Yes. Times the gradient of u, L2. Okay? I'm just putting this in. So it's uh, L1 norm of omega grad u times the L infinity norm of omega. So this is omega L2 times gradient of u, L2. Okay. And now I can use the fact that this is L2, the gradient of u is comparable to omega and L2. So now this is less than or equal to omega. L infinity times, with a constant here, omega L2 squared. Now I'm, I'm where I, I want it to be. Okay? So then that tells me that this guy is bounded by whatever it was initially times the exponential of the integral. Omega L, inf L infinity of the integral time of omega L infinity. Good. Okay. So um, let me assume that this integral here is finite, and let me call this M naught. the L1 norm in time, L, L infinity in space, norm of the vorticity. Okay. What I've just found out is that omega L2, L2 is bounded by some constant, or just put this, a function of M0. It's an exponential, but that doesn't matter. It's a function of M0. All I care is that it's finite, up to time t. Okay. All right. Uh, and now I'm going to stick this into my gradient of UL infinity bound. So then the gradient of U L, L infinity is therefore bounded by a constant 1 plus this log plus UH3 omega L infinity. Uh, and then I can just stick in this constant here Just put make it bigger because there's a plus one so it goes in here. Okay? Okay. Uh, okay. So now I look at DDT. So I said three was enough here because if, if I take m to be equals to three, okay, m minus two uh, is. Uh, Sorry, it's one, so this is not enough. I need this bigger. Ah, that's okay. That's okay. Okay, 
So I have DDT of U H M, and I'm going to add E, which is just a constant. Okay. I know that this guy uh, squared, whatever. Um, I have my estimate from here. Sorry, I want the DDT estimate. So this is going to be bounded by a constant. UM, sorry. HM plus E, I, I can add a constant at no expense, times grad U L infinity. And this, in turn, is bounded by C UM, sorry, U. Hm plus E times another constant, this one, let me call this C tilde, okay, times uh, this one plus log of E of U Hm plus E, because the bound on H3 is bounded by U and Hm. H M is bigger than, than 3. Okay. M is bigger than uh, 2 plus 3 halves, so, so it's bigger than 3. Okay. So I have this times omega L infinity. So this times this. Okay. Okay. Uh, this, this is because I had a log plus here. All right, so now let Z equal to this, U H M plus E. And my, OD, my differential inequality therefore reads Z prime less than or equal to some constant Z one plus long Z times omega infinity. Was there a question? Yes, uh, M is uh, over 3 or not? Yes, yes okay. M, M is bigger than 3 halves plus 2. Okay, thank you. Okay, which in particular is bigger than 3. Okay? Uh, yeah, it, I, I'm dealing with the strong solution that I constructed from the previous uh, theorem. Okay, so I have Z prime is bounded by this. Therefore, log z prime is bounded by c, 1 plus log z. And of course, 1 plus log z is also bounded by this. So I get log of log z plus 1 prime bounded by c times this, so log of 1 plus log c is bounded by whatever it was initially, okay. times the exponential of the integral that I'm trying to. Okay, this is going to be bounded by exponential of m naught. Okay, done, done. Because that tells me, therefore, that this this object here does not blow up. This is finite. Okay, uh, and then uh, that means that this guy here has to be finite. Okay. So, what did, what did I conclude? I concluded that if this object here is finite up to time capital T, then you then the H M norm remains bounded as well. Okay. It's a complicated bound, but it is a bound. Okay. Um, the opposite inequality is just just comes from uh, Morey's inequality. So uh, once I know that the H M norm is bounded, in particular because uh, M is sufficiently large, I know that the L infinity norm of the vorticity is going to be bounded. Okay. Just because of uh, 
<coughs> of the uh, more inequalities. And therefore, obviously, this integral here is bounded. Okay? So that's how the Beal Katomida theorem uh, works. And now let's see. Let's, and, and as I said, this is the same thing for Never Stokes and for Euler. And now let's see some consequences of Beal Katomida. Let's look at the two-dimensional situation. In 2D, the term omega dot rad u is zero. It's identically equal to zero in two dimensions. Why? Because what does 2D mean? 2D means that my velocity field u, which usually has three components, has the, the last component is zero. Okay, it's just a planar uh, flow. And each one of these depends only on spatial variables, uh, on uh, two variables. It's independent of the third variable. So two-dimensional flow means that it's translation invariant along an axis. Okay, the flow is translation invariant along an axis, and the, the, uh, the fluid remains uh, uh, only on, on the, uh, the transverse direction. All right, so in this case, you can show that omega, the vector omega, is always points in the same direction. And it can be identified with the scalar. Okay, so this would be the vector, and this would be the scalar. So I can identify it with the scalar. And therefore, the vector field omega dot gradient of u is just going to be omega dx3 u, which is 0. u does depend on, on x. So that's simply equal to 0. OK. So if mu is equal to 0, Euler. And the 2D vorticity equation reduces to this passive scalar transport equation, coupled with the system here, which is an elliptic system. And now when I write curl of u equals omega, I'm talking about the scalar omega. And this is the two-dimensional curl, which corresponds to just the, uh, uh, well, the, the, the calculation that you have to do to compute the last component of the vector, the 3D vector omega. Okay, so this is equal to ultimately grad perp dotted with u, where grad perp is minus dx2, dx1. Okay, okay. Um, one consequence of this is that. Well, if you have a particle trajectory okay, such that ddx t, dx dt is, is equal to u, then omega along this trajectory is constant. because this is a transport equation with that velocity u. Okay? So omega is constant. Therefore, the L infinity norm cannot change. Since the L infinity norm cannot change, the Beal katomida condition is satisfied for all capital T, and therefore you never blow up. QED simple as that. Okay. What happens if nu is positive? So you have never Stokes. This transport structure becomes a parabolic uh, equation and you have a parabolic maximum principle. 
and then you get omega at time t l infinity it's less than or equal to omega naught l infinity this is the max principle okay so again you can control uh, the blow up so there's no blow up for never stokes or for euler in two dimensions Okay, in 3D, situation is not only far from simple and not, not as simple, but it's actually unresolved. Okay. Okay, uh, I do want to point out a preprint by Jaji Chen and Tom Howe from, there's actually two parts. One was put, was, uh, was put in the archive in 2022, and the other one was put in the archive in 2023, maybe about a month ago or two, something like this, okay, in which they claim to have a proof of blow up in 3D Euler. Okay, the situation for Never Stokes is still out in the open, although they claim that they do have convincing evidence that you have singular deformation for a 3D diver Stokes. Okay, uh, I heard somebody say, I didn't look at the paper, but I heard somebody say that they heard a talk and that the convincing evidence is basically like there's a 50% chance that it blows up. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so what to do in this case? Well, uh, this is a, a really big problem. And there's been a, there's a lot of toy models. That have been explored to, to try to understand what's going on. Okay, for Euler and Never Stokes, mostly for Euler, but also for Never Stokes. The first model is the Constantin Lax Mida equation D omega dt plus h of omega uh, grad, L, grad omega equals zero. Okay. Uh, sorry, omega x. This is a 1D model. So it would be dx. Okay. This is, the, this is called the uh, lax uh, Maida equation. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, that's it. Omega H of omega. No, there's no dx. Sorry. Okay. So this is supposed to be the stretching term. So the term omega dot grad u, which is what's been what bothers us in three dimensions, is known as the stretching term. Uh, and the point here, I, I say that this is the first model, but I guess maybe the first model would be just the Riccati equation, y dot equals to y squared because omega and gradient of u are the same order of magnitude of, of, de, of uh, derivative, okay, same order of differentiability, regularity, and therefore the kind of, you, you're kind of studying, uh, if you look along particle paths, you're kind of studying d omega dt equals to omega squared, okay, and that blows up, that's the Riccati equation that blows up in finite time, okay? All right, so the next, the next attempt is this 1D model, dt omega plus h of omega omega equals zero. Again, this is playing the role of the vortex stretching term. Uh, I'm ignoring the convective term u dot gradient of omega because that's just a transport. So it's just substituting that by ddt of omega. h of omega here is the Hilbert transform. Okay, so it's a zeroth order uh, operator acting on omega. Okay, so this is playing the role of omega dot grad u. And this is a model that pro was proposed by Peter Constantin, uh, Peter Lax, and Amida, and I believe it's 1985. I'm not sure, okay? Uh, and it was shown to go up. Okay. Now, uh, at the time, the, what people believed was that Never Stokes did blow up and Euler did blow up in 3D, okay? So it was a surprise when um, when uh, uh, Steve Schachet 
showed that you add viscosity epsilon WXX to this equation and you still blow up. Okay. You still blow up. Okay. Uh, <coughs> this is also called the baby vorticity equation. Okay. The next the next toy model that is still under under scrutiny is the SQG equation. So this is a 1D model. This is a model for 3D Euler. Okay, a 1D analytical model for 3D Euler. A 2D model is given by the surface quasi dystrophic equation dt theta plus uh, r theta dot grad theta equals zero. Okay, so r theta, so theta is trans, sorry. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, so R theta is, is the difference between this and uh, Euler is that Euler is transported by a velocity, the vorticity for Euler is transported by a velocity which is one, de one degree, one derivative better than the vorticity. Here, uh, theta is being transported by a velocity which is of the same order. Okay, so what is R? In fact, this is R perp. Okay. So R is the uh, gradient of the Laplacian to the minus one half. Okay, it's a zeroth order operator in two dimensions. Okay, um, now <coughs> uh, how is this related to three D order? This is related through the derivative. Okay, so if you take a derivative of this, then what you get is basically this plus this times gradient of grad theta uh, plus uh, r perp grad theta times uh, grad theta equals zero. Okay. And now you can see that you have Euler, 3D Euler. Here's my u, okay, or here's my omega, in fact. Here's my omega again, okay. This is my u, which is one derivative better than omega, okay. And here I have uh, r perp dot grad theta is. Did somebody ask a question? Oh, it was outside. Okay. Okay. So this term here is one derivative, is uh, the same order, right? So this is a zeroth order operator acting on omega times omega. Okay? That's what this term is. So this is R perp times the vorticity, the quote vorticity, the gradient of theta is standing in for the vorticity times the vorticity, so this term here is representing my omega dot grad u. Okay? Okay, so this is why the interest in the SQG. Okay? It's a stand-in for a 3D order, right? And we still don't know whether this blows up or not. Same as for 3D order. We do not know. Okay? Okay. Uh, the situation for Never Stokes is completely different. And in particular, in particular, uh, once we got to this point where we do not know whether Never Stokes blows up or not, it's time to look for weak solutions. And actually, uh, history went sort of the other way around. And first, we found the weak solutions globally in time, and then uh, we found the singularity problem, basically. So what I'm going to talk about now is uh, Le Ray Hopf. Okay. 
weak solutions. Okay, so I should start with a definition. Okay. I'm going to say that U belonging to L infinity in time, L2 in space, and this is always L2 sigma. And just I don't want to deal with L2 sigma comma x. Okay, intersect L2 in time, H1 in space, intersect continuous in time into L2 with the weak topology. Okay, is a weak Lorey-Hopf or Lorey-Hopf weak solution. Actually, this should be like this. Lorey-Hopf weak solution if with initial data. And now I'll put this in L2 sigma. Okay. If this is in Rn, okay, if uh, the divergence of u is zero in d prime of Rn for, ev for almost every t, first two To time derivative of u belongs to L4 over n in time into h minus 1. I'm cheating here. Okay, this isn't really h minus 1, but we're going to pretend it is uh, in these lectures because otherwise it gets too complicated. Okay? The reason is because actually this space, the space that goes here, is the dual space to h1 divergence free. And that's not really h minus 1. Okay? But let's pretend it is. Okay? So, okay. Uh, and for every test vector field, which is an h, sorry, just smooth compactly supported, closed at time t equals 0, divergence free, so I don't have to worry about my pressure, okay, divergence in x at 0, it holds that. So now I'm going to write the weak formulation of the Never-Stokes equations, which is basically you take the Ever Stokes equation, so you hit it with phi, you throw derivatives onto the test vector field, and you integrate away. Okay. So I want integral in time from zero to plus infinity in R n. n for me is going to be two or three. Okay? And I have d u dotted with dt phi plus u d phi u. What is this? This is the Jacobian matrix of phi. Okay, so just the Jacobian matrix. This is u uh, line vector, row vector. This is u column vector. Okay, so this, is, this gives me a number. Plus, the pressure term is gone. New times u Laplacian phi dotted plus the integral, so this is dx dt, and plus I still have the initial data because I asked phi to be compactly supported in the closed interval, zero. So it's going to be phi at time zero times u naught. If this is equal to zero for every test vector field, with the, which is divergence free. And one more thing, very important, the energy inequality. U at time t, 
L2 squared plus twice mu integral from 0 to t gradient of u. L2 squared less than or equal to u naught L2 squared. Okay? All right, so this is my definition, not mine, it's Larry Hopps uh, definition of a weak solution. And the theorem is let u not be arbitrary in L2 sigma, then there exists a Larry Hopps weak solution u with u0 equals to u0. This theorem was originally proved by Jean Loret in 1934, and Hopft proved a version in 1951, which basically involves doing the bounded domain case. Okay. So Loret did the, the full plane, the full space case. A very impressive feat, a very impressive piece of work. First of all, because it's still, it's very readable, uh, even in modern times, it's very readable. Two, because there was no distribution back then. So this is really a very impressive feat. Let me tell you how, to, how the proof goes. Okay, so I'm going to sketch the proof uh, in a similar way to what I did up until now. Don't have time to do every single itty bitty detail. But I want to give you the main ideas because this is really an impressive feat. Okay, so, so first of all, we're going to divide this in steps again. And I am following Larey's original uh, work here. Okay, so we introduce the approximate PDE. That Uh, step one exists a unique solution of the approximation okay let me call this solution u epsilon epsilon is going to be a parameter the approximation parameter okay my solution u epsilon l infinity in time l2 and x, um, L2 in time, H1 in x, and it'll be C infinity in time and x. Okay, it'll be smooth. Step two. Uh, okay, so this is going to be a global solution. Okay. Step two. Uh, I'm going to get uniform bounds for u epsilon with respect to the parameter, the approximation parameter. Uh, I'm going to show that u epsilon is bounded. This is the easy one. Okay, and this is the slightly harder one. Okay, step three, these are the uniform bounds that we get. Step three, pass to limit. Okay. And the weak formulation and diff free. We're not going to have a bunch of uh, array projectors here, so we need an additional uh, uh, calculation here. And step four, the energy inequality. Okay, so that's the scheme. So let's get started. Wait a second. I am 
not sure whether I have enough time to do the full proof today. I might have to stop in the middle. Okay? Okay. So step zero. I want to look at this PD. Okay, with uh, divergence and v at t equals zero. It's j epsilon the unit. Okay, so what is this? First of all, j epsilon is the same guy that it was from this morning. You just convolve with the Friedrich's modifier eta epsilon. So this is a smooth velocity. For every fixed epsilon, this is a smooth velocity. Okay? So V is, a, is supposed to be a solution to this equation. I'm going to call the solution V equals U epsilon. Okay. All right. So U epsilon is going to be a solution to this equation, where what I did is I just mollified the velocity. So this is different from the mollification from this morning. All I'm doing is putting one mollifier here. Okay. This, for those of you who, who know what I'm talking about, this is kind of like an alpha model. This is a Lorray model. Okay? All right. Uh, Divergent free, and then I, I'm mollifying the initial data. Okay? Okay. Um, step one. So, step zero was just to introduce the, the equations. All right? Uh, the, in, in a bounded domain, what you do is completely different. You use a Galerkin approximation. Okay? And I'm not going to do it. Uh, with the Galerkin. I'm going to do it with this because it's much easier, actually. Okay, step one. There exists a unique uh, U epsilon um, globally in time. Okay. Okay, so Again, I'm going to write dt u epsilon as minus as mu Laplacian u epsilon minus j epsilon u epsilon dot grad u epsilon minus the gradient of some pressure p epsilon. Okay. Uh, okay. At this stage, I need to put the Lorry projector in front of everything, get rid of the pressure. And this becomes, because I'm in the full space, the Laplacian and the Lorry projector commute, and P u epsilon is equal to u epsilon. So this is just new Laplacian u epsilon minus P, the mollified velocity. Just that. OK. So this is a heat equation. This is a, or actually three heat equations with a forcing term, F epsilon. Okay. So there's a standard solution to this given by the mild formulation or Duhamel's formula. So it's going to be nu T Laplacian U epsilon, uh, J epsilon U naught. Okay, the initial data minus the integral from 0 to t, e to the nu, t minus s Laplacian on f epsilon at s. Okay. And so f epsilon at s, which is going to be p j epsilon u epsilon dot grad u epsilon of s ds as an operator. Okay? Uh, I don't want to work with this. Uh, I think this is uncomfortable. I'm going to be working with the PD that u epsilon satisfies. Okay, it's much easier to do energy estimates. Okay? But, um, so, but in any case, what I want here is a fixed point. So I want a fixed point of the map which takes u into V given by E to the new T Laplacian, J epsilon U, uh, U naught minus integral of zero to T, E to the new T minus S 
proportion P uh, J epsilon U dot rad U. So what I'm looking for, my U epsilon is going to be a fixed point of this map. Okay? So if I put in U epsilon here, I get out U epsilon here. Okay. So I'm looking for a fixed point of this map. Okay, uh, let's do this. So in order to get a fixed point, I'm going to call all of this thing here phi of u. In other words, v is equal to phi of u. All right? Okay. So to get a fixed point, I need to know that phi takes some Banach space to another Banach space and that it's a contraction. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> okay. okay, so what's going to be my bottom space? First of all, I'm going to index it with a capital T. Okay, so based on estimates that we will derive. Let x of t equal to the continuous functions on zero t with values in a ball, the closure of a ball with respect to the L2 norm, okay, the ball centered at zero with radius twice the L2 norm of U0, okay? Of course, intersect L2 sigma. Okay, so let, let xt be that. And I want to show that phi takes xt into xt. Okay, so claim one. Uh, if u belongs to xt, then phi of u, the xt norm, is bounded by 2 u naught. Sorry, bounded by the xt norm of u, which, uh, well, it is that. Okay, claim 2. So what is the xt norm? It's the sup in time. So the sup in time is going to be bounded by this. Claim 2. Phi of u 1 minus phi of u 2 uh, xt is bounded by one half of u1 minus u2 xt, okay, which is a soup in time of the L2 norms. OK, so let's go for it. And this is for a t that I will choose, which is going to be sufficiently small. Okay. Notice that this everything here has an epsilon in it. Epsilon is fixed. Okay, this is for the for the approximation. Okay? So proof of claim one. Okay. So I can do it using properties of the heat uh, uh, operator here, the heat kernel, but I'm not going to do it. I'm going to do it directly from uh, energy estimates. Okay. So I want to estimate the L2 norm of u epsilon. Of uh, sorry, no, no, of u epsilon. No, I want to estimate. So first of all, what does so define v as phi of u? Then what this means is that dtv is equal to nu Laplacian of v 
minus minus the Lorray projector of J epsilon of U graded of U. Okay. That's what I have. Okay. Okay. So if I multiply this by V and integrate, I get, as usual, DDT one half VL two squared equals minus new L two norm of the gradient of V squared, okay, plus or minus the integral of V times J epsilon U gradient of U. And what I want to do is to put this j epsilon dot grad onto v here and then use Young's inequality. Okay. So this is equal to minus grad v l2 squared plus plus the integral of j epsilon dot grad v times okay how can i move this because i can move this this out this is a differential operator i'm sorry this should be j epsilon u okay this is a differential operator i can move this onto v or onto u and then <clears throat> when i add the two in other words j epsilon grad u plus j epsilon grad v u. This is going to be j epsilon dot grad, j epsilon u dot grad on v dot u, and j epsilon u is still divergence free. Okay. Divergence commutes with the, the uh, convolution. So this is still divergence free, so that integrates to zero, which is how come I can move this guy around. Okay, so this is less than or equal to minus mu right on a v l2 squared plus uh, I will put J epsilon u, I'm putting in L infinity, right? Yeah. L infinity, grad V, L2, U, L2. Okay? And then we just use Young. This is new, d over 2, gradient of V, L2 squared. Goes away with this guy here. And you finally wind up with J epsilon U L infinity times U L2 squared, uh, 1 over 2 nu. Okay, you just have this. Now J epsilon U L infinity, okay, this is bounded by, where am I? Uh, I it's going to be a constant C over epsilon U L two squared. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now U U originally belongs to X T, so the infinity norm in time is bounded by two U naught. Okay. So this whole thing is going to be bounded by constant over epsilon times nu. Like I said, epsilon is fixed, nu is fixed. I don't have to worry about that. No. And then I'm going to get uh, from here 4 times 4 again, u naught L2 squared. So this is another constant, 16 L to the fourth, sorry. Okay. So DDT of the L2 norm of V squared is bounded by this. All right, and, uh, and now I just integrate in time, and I'm going to get a t here, okay. which I can control how big it is. So this is just C T uh, C uh, new epsilon. The 
this constant dependence on nu and epsilon doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, who is V naught? V naught is J epsilon u naught, and the L two norm of J epsilon u naught is bounded by the L two norm of of u naught. This here. In other words, V L2 squared bounded by a constant times T plus 1 L2 squared, where now this constant here depends on epsilon, on nu, and on nu naught. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. U naught is fixed. U naught is fixed, epsilon is fixed. So if I take t sufficiently small, this is going to be certainly less than 4. Okay. So choose okay. and there I remain inside. I remain inside the, uh, the this xt. Okay, so that, that, that takes care of claim one. What about claim two? Okay, claim two is very similar, except that when you look now at what is phi of u1 minus phi of u2, And I'm going to call this V1 minus V2. Okay, so I have V1 and V2 solutions of uh, V1 is going to be a solution of this equation with U1 and, and here and U1 there. V2 is going to be a solution of this equation with U2 and, and here and there. Okay, and they both have the same initial data. Okay, so V1 minus V2 initially is zero. And if you go through the exact same uh, estimates here, you're going to get DDT of V1 minus V2 uh, equals nu Laplacian of V1 minus V2 plus, or minus actually, P J epsilon U1 grad U1 plus P J epsilon U2 grad u2 with v1 minus v2 at t equals 0 equals 0. Okay. So you multiply this by v1 minus v2 because that's what you want to estimate. You want the L2 norm of that. Okay? And then here you just add and subtract uh, j epsilon u1 grad u2 and add j epsilon u1 grad u2. Add and subtract the same thing, and you wind up with DDT one half v one minus v two l two squared. Okay, uh, you go through this whole thing, and then finally, what you get is a constant t plus one times u one l two plus u two l two. There's some squares here times u1 minus u2, l2 squared. And again, these guys are bounded for all time. OK, this is bounded. This is less than or equal to uh, 2 u naught. Each one of these is less than or equal to 2 u naught. OK, so this is just another constant. So you can choose uh, t. Sorry, there's no plus 1 at this point. The plus 1 is gone because the plus 1 came from the initial data, where is it? Okay, from here. And now we don't have this. Okay? So we just have this. And now all I want to do is to choose a, a, a t such that this constant times t is going to be less than a half. Okay? All right. So this, this, uh, this is very easy, actually, through the, the calculation, but it's actually very easy. Okay.
So therefore, my, F, my, uh, my phi is going to be traction. So there exists a, um, a fixed point okay, up until this very small time t, capital T. Okay? And then I start over. From that capital T, I start over, and I start over. Um, and finally, I have a global solution. Okay. Okay. So how do you globalize this? Because since I'm remaining, if I start out in, uh, with initial data, which is less than two times, uh, sorry, if V is such that the L2 norm soup in time is bounded by 2 times u naught. it will always remain there. So I will solve for a certain amount of time, a small, short amount of time. When I get to that last minute of time, I'm again still within the same, uh, the same space xt, so I can extend it for the, the same amount of time again and again and again, and I cover the, all, the whole line this way. Okay, I can move all over time. So that's care of uh, step 1 and step step zero and step one, and now I have step two, which is uniform estimates. So we're now in possession uh, Okay, well, I didn't show you why this is C infinity, but it is. Okay, I, okay. So let's say now that we're in possession of of a solution u epsilon to to my approximate PD. Okay. So I have for so u epsilon satisfies dt u epsilon plus j epsilon u epsilon grad u epsilon is minus gradient of pressure or some p epsilon plus nu Laplacian u epsilon and the divergence of u epsilon is zero and u epsilon at time zero is j epsilon u naught. Well, now I can multiply this equation by u epsilon and integrate as usual, and I get ddt of u epsilon L2 squared. The uh, integral of u epsilon times j epsilon u epsilon dot grad u epsilon is zero. Again, goes away. Okay, so th the integral against the gradient of pressure goes away as well. So this is equal to minus nu times the integral of the gradient of u epsilon squared. Okay, so of course, this means that u at time t, you integrate this, and you get this squared, plus twice new integral from 0 to t of gradient u epsilon squared is equal to u, the L2 norm squared of u naught epsilon, okay? And that's uniformly bounded because u naught epsilon is the convolution of u naught, which is L2, with a, with a mollifier. So that's bounded by u naught. So this first estimate, L infinity L2 intersect L2 H1, is very easy because from here I get this is a non negative quantity, therefore the, uh, the, uh, L, the L infinity norm of u epsilon the L2 norm of u epsilon um, in time is bounded by this constant, okay? And then, again, this is exactly the L2 norm squared of the uh, H1 dot norm of u epsilon. Of course, it's already proved that u epsilon is bounded in L2, L infinity in time. L infinity in time is contained in L2 in time, and therefore you're also bounded in L2 in time to H1, okay? So this, this estimate here gives you that u epsilon is bounded independently of epsilon in L infinity in time locally, L2 in space, L2 in time locally, H1 in space. Okay? This is for free. The time derivative is more complicated. 
Let's look at the PDE. What does the PDE tell us? Mu Laplace of epsilon, I just lost two derivatives, plus uh, P J epsilon U epsilon grad U epsilon. Okay, and the question is, where do these guys live? So, U epsilon belongs to L infinity in time to L2. The Laplacian is going to belong to uh, uh, some L infinity in time to H minus 2. It's not really useful. It's too, too far down the ladder. Okay, so instead we'll use this estimate here. Okay, U epsilon is L2 in time H1. You take two derivatives off of that, you're in H minus 1. That's good, okay? You just upped the regularity at the expense of a trading in time, regularity in time. Okay. So let me take phi to be an H1 function, H1 vector field, in fact, divergence-free. Okay. Um, <coughs> in fact, I want phi to be a smooth, compactly supported function. But H1, I'm going to do everything with uh, uh, H1 estimates here. Now I look at the duality pairing. What is this? Duality pairing dt u epsilon times phi. This is the duality pairing, which I hope is going to be h minus 1, h1. Like I said, the h minus 1, is, uh, I'm cheating a bit because I can only integrate this against divergence-free vector fields. So it's actually the, the, going to be in the dual space to h1 sigma, which is not exactly h minus 1, but regularity-wise, I'm in the right ballpark. Okay, so let's look at this. Okay, so this should be equal to the integral nu Laplacian u epsilon times phi plus p j epsilon u epsilon grad u epsilon times phi. And I can erase my array projector because phi is already divergence free. So whatever gradient part uh, would would vanish, integrated against phi would be would vanish. Okay, so uh, this term here, you just put a derivative onto phi. This is minus nu gradient u epsilon gradient phi plus. Here I'm going to take the j epsilon dot grad and I'm going to place it on phi. Okay, when I do that. There's a minus sign here. Actually, there's a minus sign here, and this is a plus sign. OK. Okay, so, so this is going to be bounded by, so I put absolute values everywhere now. Okay, so this is bounded by nu, gradient u epsilon L2, phi h1, or if you want, I'm going to leave it at gradient File two, okay. Plus, I'm going to put the gradient of phi in L two, and then I'm going to have j epsilon u epsilon times u epsilon in L two. Plus, Now, f times g L2 is bounded by f L4 g L4. This is just Holder's inequality, okay? Easily, easy f to figure out. And now comes into play something very important, which is, uh, is uh, it's called, in, in the fluid dynamics literature, it's called the Lajajajkaya inequality. But it's a special case of the Gallardo-Nirenberg inequalities, okay? 
And uh, so I want to write down what the Lodzhenskaya, the qualities are, as I prefer to call them. right? Oh, oh, sorry. So this is how this the logic and equality varies with dimension. So you bound the L4 norm of some vector field by the L2 norm to the power of 1 minus dimension over 4 times the L2 norm of the gradient to the power of dimension over 4. This is an interpolation and equality, okay, which basically is telling you that if you're in H1, then you're going to be in L4, okay, it's, uh, depending on it. Okay? okay? If this is bounded and this is bounded, then the L4 norm is bounded. Okay, but it's telling you exactly what the exponents, the good exponents are. Okay. So if you use this here, okay, then what you get is that this term here is going to be less than or equal to, I'm going to have j epsilon u epsilon L4 times u epsilon L4. which is basically the same thing. Great, and phi L2. Uh, now, J epsilon, so like I said, this is bounded by U epsilon L4 because the convolution is convolution with a, an L1 mollifier with L1 norm equals 1. Okay, so this is just the L4 norm squared. So this is bounded by the L2 norm of u epsilon to the power 2 minus n over 2 okay. times the gradient of u epsilon L2 to the power 2n over 4. So that's n over 2 times the gradient of phi L2 not gotten rid of this term here yet. And the reason I haven't gotten rid of this term here is because uh, I want to take advantage of my new term gradient of phi here. Okay? Uh, sorry. No. Uh, no, just leave it at that. Okay. I'm mix, mix, messing up here. Okay. Finally, this tells me that the H minus 1 norm, because this is bounded by the H1 norm, this is this. So since uh, so so then that means that the uh, h minus one norm, assuming that it's really h minus one, like I said, I want to emphasize that I'm cheating here. This h minus one norm is going to be bounded by uh, new times the gradient of u epsilon l two plus. plus u epsilon L2 to the power 2 minus n over 2 times the gradient of u epsilon L2 to the power n over 2. Okay, and the question is where does this live? This is a this function here belongs to L2 in time. Okay? 
So this belongs to L2 in time from here plus something from here. Okay. So where does this where does this live? Okay. In order to make this exponent into a two, okay, I have to multiply, I have to raise this to the power four over n. Okay? So it's going to be, and this this object here doesn't bother me because that object is L infinity. That's bounded by a constant. Okay? So it's L2 in time plus L4 over n in time. Okay? If n equals 2, that means L2 in time. Okay. If n equals 3, this gives me 4 thirds, which is smaller than 2. And therefore, the best that I can hope for is L4 thirds. Because this is a local in time estimate. Okay. So that gets me, uh, did I erase the statement? Yes, I did. That gets me exactly what I wanted. Okay, this is L4 thirds in time and uh, okay. I have one minute to do the passage to the limit. I think I will leave that for tomorrow. Okay. The, the passage to the limit is easy. What's a little bit uh, more delicate is the energy inequality, and I want to show you this carefully. Okay, so I'll leave that for tomorrow. Okay? Thank you.